13 things you probably didn't know about Leprechaun Movie. The reason why, even 27 years after its release, Leprechaun holds an ardent and massive cult following is that the film, along with the subsequent sequels and reboots, embraces absurdity. They live and breathe it. This is something that the critics have failed to understand or acknowledge since time immemorial. The titular character is an Irish sprite, a creature along the lines of a gnome or an elf. Leprechauns are friendly creatures according to the legends, but writer and director Mark Jones turned this character into a comical but ferocious antagonist. A hefty amount of credit also goes to Warwick Davis who has repeatedly played the titular Leprechaun and has done so with grace and ease. Leprechaun was the first film of 1993 and took the box office by storm, earning close to $2.5 million in the opening weekend alone. The film follows the Irish green beast going on a rampage after someone steals his gold coins. The intended victim of this massacre turns out to be a young damsel, played by now famous Jennifer Aniston. St. Patrick's Day has always been linked to Irish legends, but since 1993, movie buffs have set about viewing movie marathons comprised of the Leprechaun anthology. In this video, we will enlighten you with some of the most fascinating and least known facts about this cult classic. Before we go into our list, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but it means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin. Leprechaun was based on a comic book. More than a few things inspired writer and director Mark Jones to make the film, but only a few know that Trimark Pictures, the company producing the film, released an eight-page comic book before its release. In the comic, a farmer from Ireland named Danny O'Grady follows a rainbow belonging to a leprechaun. He steals the pot of gold at the end and sells it to a local jeweler. The leprechaun trails O'Grady and seeks to kill him, burning down his farmhouse but failing to recover his gold. The leprechaun then goes on a killing spree and kills anyone who he thinks might have his treasure. O'Grady flees from Ireland and boards a plane to America although we see the leprechaun in the plane's cargo. Despite this, the film depicts the story a little differently, reporting that O'Grady captured the leprechaun to take the gold, rather than following a rainbow and stealing it. How did you find me? <laughs> the wee people have their magical ways. A serial commercial inspired the director. Creative people find ideas from the most common things, so was the case with Mark Jones. Probably on a lazy evening, Mark Jones came across a Lucky Charms commercial that featured a cute little leprechaun. And that was his eureka moment. He always wanted to be a film director and in 1985 was trying to write a script, looking for something he couldn't mess up. A low-budget horror film about the Irish green monster in the serial seemed to be the way to go. Leprechauns are considered friendly beings, but Jones gave the concept a twist turning the creature into an antagonist. Another source of inspiration for Jones was the 1986 film Critters. This film, directed by Stephen Herrick, also featured small but deadly antagonists who go on a killing spree. Interestingly, Leprechaun was supposed to be a textbook horror film featuring a deadly monster, but Warwick Davis, who played the titular character, suggested that there should be a heightened comic element. Davis pitched the idea that his character's dialogue should be dark but witty, and Jones agreed. This is what you're looking for, right? <laughs> Leprechaun was Jennifer Aniston's film debut. Before Jennifer Aniston became the star she is today, and before she played the lovely Rachel Green in the sitcom Friends, she made her debut in the film Leprechaun. Back when they were looking for the female lead, Jennifer was not a star and had very little experience, so Trimark was apprehensive about hiring her. She had had small roles, such as a background dancer in Mac and Me. Mark Jones appreciated her work in Ferris Bueller and insisted that she was best suited for the role. Years later, when Jennifer became such a huge star and contributed to the film's legacy and popularity, everyone wanted to take credit for bringing her on board. However, Jennifer herself 
isn't a fan of the film and hardly ever watches it. In one interview, she revealed that when she was watching it with a few friends, she was constantly cringing and storming in and out of the room. But she does still appreciate the opportunity she was given. And why not? Like many other household names in Hollywood, Jennifer got her first big break from a low-budget horror film. Leprechaun's release was delayed by two years for promotional reasons. The film's production was completed by 1991, but it collected dust on a shelf for the next two years because Trimark was not able to secure deals with promotional partners. Initially, they went to food chains like Domino's and Subway, but these food giants felt that the grisly monster was rather distasteful for their franchise. Trimark then improvised and decided on a more grassroots level of promotion. They began contacting individual outlets all over the country. And this is how they were able to secure deals with such outlets in more than 25 cities. They also partnered with the National Basketball Association and the American Stock Exchange. A leprechaun rang the opening bell at the ASE, the first time that a film character had ever done so. Leprechaun made $9 million. The critics bashed the film left, right and centre. From the direction and acting to the action and humour, they left no stone unturned, cruelly terming the film a mess. However, audiences knew better. Leprechaun is one of those films that shouts about how critics can be wrong. The promotion succeeded, and the film made a whopping $2.5 million in the opening week. Ultimately, with a budget of close to $1 million, Leprechaun made almost $9 million and sold over 100,000 VHS copies. A huge credit for the film's later success goes to the immense fan following Aniston gained. However, Leprechaun also became a cult hit in its own right, generating five sequels. The latest installment to the anthology is the 2018 film Leprechaun Returns, which serves as a direct sequel to the 1993 film. Leprechaun has become a cultural icon of sorts and cable channels like Sci-Fi have made it the norm to broadcast the anthology on St. Patrick's Day. No! 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 Leprechaun 2 was almost a completely different movie. Leprechaun 2 revolves around a millennia-old leprechaun. The leprechaun wanted to marry the beautiful daughter of his human slave, and when the father managed to help his daughter to escape, the leprechaun killed him. However, the leprechaun also pledged to marry a descendant of the girl in a thousand years. The film then jumps to the present day, and we find the Irish beast looking for his comely and but highly reluctant damsel played by Siobhan Durkin. However, this is far from what Mark Jones wanted. He was one of the producers of Leprechaun 2 and wanted Warwick Davis to play the original leprechaun's wife. She would come to America looking for her husband, but would be equally ferocious and murderous. The other producers did not agree to this plotline, and the film went ahead without Jones' suggestion. Marvelous Videos thinks that Jones' story would have served as a great sequel, but sometimes filmmakers don't want risks and take a more traditional path. Unsurprisingly, this film didn't share its predecessor's success resulting in Leprechaun 3 being released directly to video. The sequel's poor reception was rooted in its continuity errors. Warwick Davis's makeup took three hours to apply. Warwick Davis has undertaken various great roles over the course of his career, but his most notable few remain his titular role in Willow, Professor Flitwick in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, and of course his recurring titular role in the Leprechaun Anthology. All his roles demand heavy makeup, but the most challenging of all was the process required to transform him into the Leprechaun. He'd wake up before dawn and spend hours in a chair getting his makeup done, having to remain still and resist fidgeting or getting up. He was very conscious of the effort that went into his makeup, and he didn't want to give the artist a hard time. 
However, sitting on a chair for hours and doing nothing is a task in itself. So Davis would speak to the makeup artists about random things, everything from family to politics, in order to pass the time. Interestingly, Davis appears out of character in the film's cafe scene without the leprechaun makeup. The Leprechaun 3 production team wasn't really allowed to film in Las Vegas. Leprechaun 3 begins with the small beast turned into a statue by a magical medallion, a statue that is now being sold at a pawn shop in Vegas. When the pawn shop owner removes the medallion, the Leprechaun assumes his real form and attacks. He then goes on to a casino to find a magical coin that grants wishes. Wherever he goes, death follows him. Despite being set in Las Vegas, much of the filming actually took place in Los Angeles. However, director Brian Trenchard-Smith did decamp to Sin City itself for a night to film exterior shots. In an interview, he revealed that the Golden Nuggets said to him that he may not shoot outside their premises. Trenchard-Smith simply went to the Golden Nugget, stuck his 14mm lens on the pavement, and had the leprechaun in the foreground apparently towering over it. <laughs> Warwick Davis kept the role light. The Leprechaun franchise is a film series even many horror enthusiasts regard as a camp joke. They consider it a film that's pointless, unwatchable, has a poor story, and packs predictable frights. On the other hand, there are those who hail it as a cult classic, appreciating the evil-looking beast and the grim energy that he constantly radiates. One of these adorers of the Leprechaun series is Warwick Davis himself. Davis reveals that he loved playing the Leprechaun and realized that his portrayal didn't have to be a heady exploration of the subconscious. According to the actor, the Leprechaun series consists of films that need to be watched while having a beer with friends. You may as well keep your brain in the freezer and enjoy the films for what they are. Naturally, Davis made sure that he played the character with this attitude in mind and kept the role light. Film series is perfect for drinking games on St. Patrick's Day. You can take a shot every time the leprechaun kills or says something witty. <coughs> leprechaun was shot in some iconic and blasphemous locations. Leprechaun's journey started at Tory's Ranch in North Dakota, and from there he would go on to explore Los Angeles, Las Vegas, South Central, and even outer space. But we are not here to discuss geography. Film was shot on the same ranch as the TV shows Little House on the Prairie and The Waltons, shows which were about family bonds, children, and the struggles of common people. There was no hint in those shows of anything supernatural and benevolent hiding in the bushes waiting to make its next kill. The irony is in the contrast between these famous works. In the film, the leprechaun breaks the neck of a cop at the bottom of the hill. And in Little House on the Prairie's opening credits, three children are seen running down the same hill. When you think about it, this is just dark and unsettling. Naturally, Davis, in his memoir Size Matters Not, described the film as blasphemous for this very reason. I'll never tell you. <laughs> the wheelchair scene was difficult to film. There are many great scenes in this film, though one of the most iconic is the wheelchair chase sequence, when the leprechaun is after Tori. The pretty girl in hot pants runs to save her life while the Irish beast chases her through the corridors. This scene was particularly difficult to shoot because Davis would constantly lose control of the wheelchair he was driving and would either sway sideways or ram into walls. Ultimately, Aniston had to run in slow motion so that Davis could keep up with her. By the end, it turned out to be a perfect scene, combining all the essential ingredients of a good chase. What adds to the beauty of the scene is the energy that Aniston brings. She was deemed to be a great actress, and this scene proves it. It's a special birthday for a leprechaun. I'm 1,000 years old. The creators weren't worried about plot continuity. In the first film, the leprechaun was 600 years old, 
but Leprechaun 2's antagonist is celebrating his 2000th birthday. This and other apparent continuity errors in the series have led to the theory among fans that Davis is playing different Leprechauns in each installment. Clearly, no thought was given to the continuity, and Trimark founder Mark Ammon has agreed this is the case. Likewise, director Brian Trenchard-Smith said that people shouldn't be looking for continuity, and if they did so, they had too much time on their hands. The sequel naturally gains more from not trying to adhere to continuity of its predecessor, as that way, it has far more freedom. The Leprechaun is a being that lives eternally. And because of this immortality, even if he gets killed in one film, he can just come back in the next one. Leprechaun vs Candyman almost happened. If you're still watching this video about Leprechaun, then we'll take the liberty to assume that you are an authentic movie buff, and you know all about another great character, Candyman. Candyman was a 1992 film based on a piece of work by legendary writer Clive Barker, concerning a violent ghost of a 19th century black man who was killed for falling in love with the daughter of a wealthy white man. Both the Candyman and Leprechaun films gen garnered massive cult followings in the 90s when they were released. But by the new millennium, the popularity of Leprechaun film was declining. And so, after the success of Freddy vs. Jason in 2003, there was rumbling of a crossover in which the gold-hungry Green Beast would fight against the slasher who knew no limits. The film almost reached pre-production, but when the script was brought to Tony Todd, he axed it. He reasoned that earlier crossovers of legendary characters such as the 1948 film Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein didn't just fail commercially, but also tarnish the reputation of the characters. This is all the time we had for today's episode. We hope you guys liked it. It would be awesome if you guys can take some time to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to tell us which topic you want us to cover in the comment section. Have a fantastic day ahead and stay safe.